Unfortunately, none of our efforts worked. So we decided to use that crucial new legal tool, Title VI. ZOA took legal action with the support of students at Brooklyn College. We filed a complaint. We filed a complaint against Brooklyn College under Title VI, alleging that the college had failed to remedy a hostile campus environment for Jewish students in violation of the law. The U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights enforces Title VI. Recently, this federal agency informed us that it would be investigating several allegations of our complaint, and we are hopeful that now that the federal government is involved, the college will finally begin to address the campus hostilities that are harming Jewish students. ZOA has also been working with Jewish students to fight campus anti-Semitism at Northeastern University in Boston. This is another school, like Brooklyn College, where people are shocked to hear about problems of anti-Semitism because there's such a strong and vibrant Jewish presence on those campuses. But for many Jewish students at Northeastern, the environment has felt unwelcome and even unsafe. The menorah displayed on the Northeastern campus has been vandalized numerous times. Hateful anti-Israel events are sponsored by the anti-Israel student group on that campus. But the most serious problem reported to us is what's been going on inside the classroom. Professors have been intimidating and even threatening Jewish students. In one course, a professor gave a lecture on why Hamas should be given legitimacy. He told his students that for the next class, he wanted them to write a short paper reflecting on his lecture. Well, one of his students completed the assignment appropriately. She wrote in her paper that in her view, Hamas could not be given legitimacy, that Hamas is a terrorist group, and in fact, the United States government has designated Hamas as a terrorist group. So in her view, Hamas was not entitled to any legi legitimacy whatsoever. Well, her professor told her that if she didn't rewrite her paper, she'd get a bad grade on it. She refused to rewrite the paper. She ended up with a bad grade. This Jewish student was penalized because she would not endorse her professor's personal pro-terrorist agenda. ZOA, ZOA sent a detailed letter to the president of Northeastern University. His name is Joseph Ayun. We described all the problems that had been reported to us. Our letter was based on interviews with close to 20 Northeastern students, as well as faculty and members of the community. We reminded President Ayun in our letter of his obligations under the law to protect the Jewish students on his campus. The ZOA's letter helped shine a light on the campus problems, and I am happy to tell you that it helped inspire Northeastern to finally start addressing the anti-Semitism on campus. <laughs> Last month, President Ayun gave his annual State of the University address. Next to the school's graduation ceremony, this is the most attended event at the school. President Ayun said in his address that going forward, there would be a zero tolerance policy for anti-Semitism on the campus. <laughs> this, this president had never used the word anti-Semitism before, even when the menorahs were vandalized on the campus. Then just a few short weeks ago, the administration at Northeastern issued a message to faculty cautioning them that students must be able to express their views without fear of threats or intimidation or retaliation. These are significant steps forward. There is more work to be done, but I am so proud that the ZOA is standing up for Jewish students like no other organization. But ZOA could not do it without the support of students. I am happy to tell you that many of the students we're working with are here tonight from Rutgers University, 
from Brooklyn College and from Northeastern University. And I'd like to ask those students and recent graduates of those schools to please stand so that we can honor you for your courage and your leadership. I can't see you, but I want to tell you that we thank you. We thank you for standing up for your right to a college campus that is safe and welcoming to you as Jews and supporters of Israel. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's now my privilege to introduce to you our fantastic director of our campus department, Sharona Whistler. There's a lot of work to do. Thank God, ZOA, ZO, thank God ZOA has a dedicated and fearless team of campus coordinators. ZOA's campus department is on the front lines of Israel activism on campus, and we're obviously not afraid to to, to confront the vicious lies and anti-Israel activities that are prevalent on so many campuses. Students know they can turn to ZOA for truth, and we're there to support them. We're doing a lot of this important work with student leaders, many of whom are here tonight, and we're proud to be bringing an exceptional group to Israel this winter on ZOA's student leadership mission to Israel, with great thanks to our dear friend, Myron Zimmerman. These students' commitment to Zionism should not be underestimated. I'm inspired several times a day by their activism, which is why at the end of last school year, we wanted to hear from them. And so, again, with thanks to Myron, we held an essay contest and asked students to explain why Zionism is important today. Essays came in from across the country, and every essay deserves recognition for the many thoughtful responses and time spent researching. However, one essay stood out in its formulation and content, and I am pleased to present an award to the grand prize winner of the best essay, Daniel Cohen from Columbia University. Thank you so much, Sharona. Your dedication to the ZOA shows in everything you do, and that's been very inspiring. As a student activist on campus, what worries me is not just the apathy we face, it's the mi ongoing misrepresentation of Zionism. That's why I wrote my essay and emphasized the freedom and the optimism that Zionism means to me. At the ZOA, I found friends and allies ready to do everything in their power to combat these dangers and bring passion back to this most important cause. Thank you. Mazel tov, mazel tov, congratulations. You can feel the excitement growing, or maybe that's hunger pangs, but um, I'd like to call upon Jim Pollock to come forward. Jim is a member of our ZOA board, and he's a special advisor to Congresswoman Michelle Bachman. Jim, please come forward. Good evening. Given recent events, this is a very solemn evening, but not an evening for us to give up hope. The business of Israel is always serious business. And I'd like to say I and we are honored to have two ex-presidential candidates here where had either one of them been elected, Israel's safety and security would be vastly different than it is right now. And that deserves an applause. Applause. 
I'm James Pollock and a proud member of the ZOA Board of Directors. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. I was honored to have served as her finance chairman for her presidential run two years ago and served as her general campaign chairman in her congressional race last year. I can tell you without the remotest qualification that there is no one in Washington, D.C., or maybe anywhere, more focused, more supportive, more concerned, or more intellectually knowledgeable of the serious situation Israel finds herself in today than Congresswoman Michelle Bachman. And let me point out that to her, Israel is not just another important issue in her day-to-day -day activities. It may well be the single most important issue she works on when she's in Washington, D.C., and when she's in her district. From the day after graduating high school to leaving to go to Israel to work on a kibbutz to her well over a dozen trips to Israel since then to publicly fighting for Israel on the media on a very regular basis, fighting in the House Intelligence Committee for Israel, fighting in the House Financial Services Committee for Israel, to meeting regularly with many, if not most, of Israel's leaders. Her passion, her courage, her conviction, and her dedication for Israel is beyond measurement. And different from most others in Washington, D.C., she is a true public servant, not a political servant, speaking out when necessary on Israel and other issues, even when it is not acceptable to her own political party. She has been called, on a number of occasions, our Margaret Thatcher. Mort Klein has recently referred to her on several occasions as our Queen Esther. And I've even heard people lately refer to her as maybe our next goal to my ear. Without further ado, let me introduce a great lady for God, a great lady to ZOA, and an even greater lady for our State of Israel, Congresswoman Michelle Bachman. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. What an honor. Thank you. Jim, thank you for those remarkable words. I'm very grateful, very humbled, and very honored. And I also want to say to everyone in this room tonight that I think had the presidential election been held today or tomorrow, we would have had a completely different outcome of the 2012 election. I want to say also that I'm absolutely thunderstruck sometimes at how history brings itself about on certain days. And you look at the events that have occurred in the last few weeks, and I want to thank our very good friend Mort, Mort Klein, for holding this event today, of all days. I picked it intentionally. <laughs> when you think that the hinge of history literally could have turned between last night and today, when in this time when we're entering into a time of darkness in the year, we're coming up to what's the shortest day of the year, the great darkness that comes upon the world with the sun and the limitations that we have on daylight. We're also looking at a political darkness, and really you might say a spiritual darkness that is descending upon our world. And it's not too melodramatic to say 
that with this turn of events, the P5 plus one, the great nations of the world got together in Geneva and brought about a tremendous decision with the import to change the world forever. And they made it. They made this decision. And all we have heard about is Iran and what this decision is about Iran, rightly so. But I submit to you tonight that that decision that was made by the P5 plus one in Geneva had more to do with Israel than it had to do with Iran. And let me tell you why. Because you see, the decision that was made could be the biggest cudgel that our president and that the nations of the world could use to prevent Israel, the Jewish state of Israel, from defending not only herself, but her right to exist. You see, Israel may be forced now, when the greatest nations of the world have abandoned her in her time of greatest need, in my humble opinion, when Israel may have to stand alone, if it's possible in a day and age that we live in for a nation to stand alone. How is it possible? I sit on the Intelligence Committee. We deal with the classified secrets of the United States. We deal with terrorism. The United States is facing greater threats today than we have ever faced before. And in the midst of that context, when Israel, the greatest friend the United States has, the greatest ally the United States has, the nation at the tip of the spear in the war on terror, the United States, as Mort had mentioned in his remarks, has had the most unprecedented intelligence leaks in the history of the United States. One coming from our former defense secretary when he said he believed that Israel may attack Iran in two to four months' time, if you remember that leak. We all thought, well, gee, that might have been a mistake. Then another leak came out, unprecedented that said that Israel was cooking up some sort of a deal with Saudi Arabia to use an air base at Azerbaijan in case they may need to strike. And then we started to see every three, four days, printed in the front page of the New York Times, secrets that less than 10 people in the United States knew. How did this happen? Unprecedented. How could it be? You see, one thing I noticed being on the Intelligence Committee, that every one of these secrets served to undermine and cut the legs out of Israel and her ability to be able to defend herself. Every intelligence leak put Israel in a more negative position than she had been in before. Uncanny. How could it be? And you see what happened in Geneva in these last few weeks has put Israel in a situation where the world will now say, we have six months for Iran to prove herself that she is worthy of be joining the nuclear partners. So let's give Iran a chance. Now think of this. Put this in your mind. How will the world view an Israel that sees that it's down to its last few options if it hopes to survive in the future? You see, it may be incumbent upon the Prime Minister to make a decision he has no desire to make, and that would be to bomb facilities that must be bombed in Iran. <laughs> and as Mort refer referred to the remarks of the Supreme Leader, he isn't called a Supreme Leader for nothing. And as the Supreme Leader said, not one iota of their nuclear program would change. And when he made his remarks to the tens of thousands of paramilitary officers in the Revolutionary Guard, they pumped not only words on a flag, they pumped their fists in the air and shouted, death to America, death to America. This is just as the deal is being struck. This is usually when you put your best foot forward. Now, don't forget Dr. Morsi, 
almost on the night before he was about to have his election to be the president of Egypt. Same thing. He said, Jews need to sleep with their eyes wide open because we plan to march into El Quds, millions, and kill the Jews. This was the night before the election, usually when you put your best foot forward. I say again, as I have said before, when a madman speaks, listen, and realize that for members of Congress, for whom it's very easy to say, I love Israel, I'm pro-Israel, I say to you and I ask you this question, where were the United States senators in the last few weeks? Where have they been? What have they said? Where have they been on sanctions? I say to you, where have the members of the House of Representatives been in the last few weeks? What have they said? What have they done? What have they said on sanctions? Where have the Jewish organizations in the United States been in the last few weeks, other than Zionists of America? Where have they been? Where have the Christian organizations who stand with Israel been in the last few weeks? You see, it's one thing to be a friend of Israel when the sun is shining and when the times are good and GDP is working. It's another to be a friend of Israel and to make the case that Israel not only has the right to exist, but the right to defend herself, and that right may possibly include the right to be able to bomb nuclear facilities or potential <laughs> nuclear facilities in Iran, who will use that weapon undisputedly to achieve its ultimate goals. You see, we are in an, an unprecedented time. And in the next six months, President Obama has bought three things with this move and the great powers of the world. They bought the ability for Iran to keep on keeping on. Of 19,000 centrifuges, these will continue to spin. They'll continue to enrich to 5%. That's not easy. That's hard. But they'll be able to do that. They will be able to continue to test missiles. They will be able to essentially keep on keeping on. I just came back from Israel last week. We had met with the intelligence minister while we were there. We talked about the plutonium facility in Iraq, the heavy water facility. And he told us this is a joke about the plutonium facility. It won't even be up and running until next August. Six months? The, the Ayatollah is going to give up six months? He wouldn't even be ready by then. It's nothing. You see, they are giving up nothing and next to nothing. And in exchange, a facade has been blown up that Iran's being real good guys right now. In other words, putting all the pressure on Israel. You cannot possibly strike now. Tell me, will they be able to strike after six months? You see, I believe now is when we do need to stand with Israel today. Because our... <laughs> Prime Minister Netanyahu may be forced very soon to do what the United States and the other nations of the world have already said today with clarity what they will not do. And that's the other thing that we should be grateful for. I'm not here with the gloom and doom. I'm here with gratefulness, gratefulness and great joy in this wonderful nation called Israel. I felt more joy there this month than I have ever felt before, and great hope. Because you see, this great nation is lighting a candle. It believes in life, l'chaim, it believes in life. And that's what we too must believe in. And so tonight we unite our hearts as we stand with Israel, not for death, but for life because that's what we believe the future of Israel is and always will be. And I thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Outstanding. Thank you.
Yes, please be seated. We're going to uh, start dinner. I know it's shocking. Um, and I'm going to ask the wait staff to please uh, start serving dinner, but I would like to just recognize a few uh, dignitaries in the audience, although all of you in my mind are dignitaries. And I'll just mention some names, but please, uh, I ask the wait staff to start serving dinner. Dr. Michael Goldblatt, the tireless ZOA chairman of the board. Erwin Hochberg, vice chairman of the ZOA board. Yes, feel, feel uh, free to applaud. The former chair of the UJC, Jewish Federation, national campaign chair of Israel Bonds and the Brandeis, a former Brandeis awardee. Mr. Henry Schwartz, ZOA officer and treasurer, leader in the fight against Iran, nukes, through his organization, Impact. I'd like to especially welcome Professor Frederick Lawrence, the president of Brandeis University. And we welcome you, we congratulate you for doing the right thing, we thank you. Ms. Excuse me, Dr. Alan Kadish, I'm looking for Dr. Kadish, where is he sitting? Dr. Kadish, besides being president of Turo College, he and I, he's a noted cardiologist, and he and I were in the same carpool together to going to high school. So I'm, that's really his claim to fame, by the way. Okay. Dr. Daniel Pipes, who I met earlier, author and renowned Biddy scholar, ZOA Ben Hecht awardee. Mr. Richard Stone, past chairman of the Conference of Presidents, also professor of law at Columbia University. University. Steve Emerson, author and distinguished U.S. activist fighting radical Islamic terrorism. Mr. Martin Gross, president of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and former Brandeis awardee. Mr. Chuck Jacobs, the courageous leader of Americans for Peace and Tolerance. Mr. Robert Spencer, the author and major activist exposing the dangers of radical Islam. Sylvia Fryer, a ZOA officer, Brandeis awardee, and she is soon to be honored at the Bedell dinner coming up. Miss Nina Rosenwald, ZOA board member and Brandeis awardee, who along with Lawrence Kadish, rank among the leading pro-Israel philanthropists in America. Mr. Bart Blatstein, officer of ZOA, foremost real estate developer in Philadelphia. Dr. Stanley Benzel, ZOA officer, past Brandeis awardee. Mr. Ellie Hertz, ZOA officer, Brandeis awardee. And I'm told that Frank Sotero, elected official, has joined us. I want to mention one thing. There is a book available in the lobby that was written by the current co-president of the Philadelphia region. It's known as Pressing Israel, Media Bias Exposed. It's by Lee Bender and by the vice president of the Philadelphia region, Jerry Verlin. So please, you can obtain copies of that in the lobby. I'm just going to ask for a moment of quiet for one moment. Shh, just one moment, while we recognize and mourn the passing. Shh, I'd want to recognize and mourn the passing of several great Zionist leaders and ZOA supporters in the past year, if I may. And just let me mention their names. Shh, Jacques Turchina, Judge Al Kleiman. Jerome Taylor, Newt Becker, Samuel Halpern, Edwin Goldberger, Rick Fine, and Professor Ben Sion Netanyahu. We, we mourn their passing, and tragically, shh, we have lost these great Zionists, but I am heartened by the presence, as Susan said, of the next generation of committed Zionist leadership, and I want to recognize that we have 200 students from colleges and universities all along the Eastern Seaboard. We call them the tables of our future, and there are 18 tables, chai. So please, welcome them in your hearts. Welcome these young men and women. <coughs> While you're enjoying dinner, <coughs> we have a special treat. 
we have some wonderful musical entertainment for you to enjoy. Yes, Paul McCartney is here. No, I knew I'd get your attention. Okay. Well, maybe not. We have the wonderful group of singers from colleges throughout New York City. They're called Tizmoret. They are a Queens College Hillel professional Jewish a cappella group. Now, this group has performed all along the East Coast, and they won the fifth annual Long Island College a cappella challenge. And they were winners at Kol Haolam, the first national college Jewish a cappella competition. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Tiz Moret. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for having us. My name is Daria Rubenstein. I'm the president of Tiz Moret, Queens College Hello a cappella group. This is our wonderful musical director, Daniel Hankin. I would also like to say thank you so much to Susan Tuckman for reaching out to us. Hi, Susan. Um, and we are going to start, we're going to sing a few songs for you while you're enjoying your dinner. And we're going to start with Imesh Kachach. We hope you enjoy. Thank you for having us. Ha ha ha! 
Thank you very much. The next song we're going to sing is an English song called Hafachta Mispidili, We Turn Your Sorrow into Joy When We Think of Jerusalem. Testing. Oh, yes, you do. You feel me 